looks like the presenters are starting to arrive. Thank you, Linda. So, so do I call you Linda or Linda Lou? Linda. Linda. I started okay. Microsoft in 89, back when it was just a Wii company and people just had their first names. And there was already a Linda and my middle name's Lou, which I thought was kind of cute. So I went with Linda Lou. And then when I came back to the company, you know, 20 years later, my email alias just was Linda Lou still. So I'm one of the few yeah. companies that has my first name. But people yeah. like it. So they call me Linda Lou, but Linda's fine. Okay. Would you like to practice sharing? I have content. I was going to just post talk and post links into the chat. I have some stuff in preview, like I'm working on this accessibility portal dev center for for access developers. Not ready yet in beta. I can share that. And then there's also the new access update on the website, but that people can also just click on that too. I also have these screen narrator jars lined up. The audience needs to hear my machine. (laughs) I did have on my agenda that I wanted to talk about familiarizing yourself with the adaptive tools. You mentioned the screen reader, JAWS, we have NVDA, and then Microsoft has Narrator. We also have the keyboard access, which is setting up tab stops correctly so you can tab through your app and click through and hit enter and send an invoice, that sort of thing. It has to work for people who can only access keyboard or the puffer, similar technology. And then voice access is Microsoft's latest adaptive technology. And that's where you just speak to the computer. It's kind of like Cortana 5.0. I mean, it's very advanced. I could pop in next month and we could just hit like one adaptive technology, you know, 10 minutes per meeting just as an intro so people understand what persons with disabilities are using for their apps. The other demo that I have lined up is Accessibility Insights. Great. So I can talk a little bit about the experience of doing Northwind 2 and working with your team and being very surprised and then learning about um, what is needed. That's great. I just got a message from Kim. Zoom crashed her computer, so she's rebooting. (laughs) <laughs> so, hopefully there's not applying a windows update going on <laughs> is that peter cole the, the theme it guy yes nice, yeah, to nice, me. Me. nice to meet you there he is <laughs> he's been wanting you to contact him to bring northwind themes up a step yeah or, we've been we've been step. chatting a little bit i uh, i just heard from him well, he is the world's expert on themes, and he's a I can tell. programmer. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> and he's a really nice guy. And he, and he looks like he's older than me. Yay, someone's older than me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm old, <laughs> but not, not as old as some. Whenever I have a meeting like this and I'm going to present or it's a large group, I always run Windows Update, then I restart my computer, and then I do it again. <laughs> And then I only load the apps I actually need, you know. I'm always afraid to run updates before a presentation because I'm afraid that it's going to change something, you know. Yeah. But especially, especially with Teams. Teams is always changing. It may look like I'm working, but I'm actually just listening to a true crime podcast mug. No. <laughs> All right. Well, Kim says to go ahead and start without her. So since it's 1201, I think I will do that. Welcome, everybody. My name is Maria Barnes. I run Access Lunchtime User Group. And today we have three presenters. We have Linda Cannon, Kim Young, who's not yet on. She was on and she got kicked off. And Tom Van Stipout. And they're all three going to talk a little bit about accessibility, which they really had to work with when they were developing Northwind 2.0. Also, since Linda is the new Access Program Manager, we thought we could have her give a brief introduction and you could get to meet her and maybe do a little bit of a Q&A. So as I understand, we're going to start with the accessibility section, correct? Yeah. And which of you is starting here? I would say, Linda, take it away. Sure. Hi, folks. 
I'll get to the more intro about me a little bit later, but I wanted to introduce you to Microsoft's concept of what accessibility is for our products. So as you know, Microsoft runs on trust. That's our buzz line. And up until a few years ago, our main compliance issues were security and privacy, but we've added accessibility. So accessibility is just as important as those other two pillars, and all of our apps have to be accessible for persons with disabilities using adaptive technologies, which are screen readers for people with low vision, blind or low vision people, keyboard access, a lot of people who have different disabilities and can't use a mouse use the keyboard, and then there's a new technology that Microsoft released called Voice Access, which is just speaking to the computer and telling it what to do. So when we released the Northwind templates, we did an accessibility pass before we released, and we found some things, and then there were a couple lingering issues, which Tom will continue to talk about. But I wanted to share some resources with you about Microsoft's view on accessibility. Accessibility now isn't just a nice-to-have add-on. It's something that you need to bake into your development process. And I'm going to give you a couple tools and things that you can look at to get you started on that path. I think the most important thing is to understand these adaptive technologies, understand what screen reader, keyboard access, voice access do. The link I just pasted will send you down the road where you can find demos, all the tools that we're going to talk about today. When I was given the role of accessibility driver for the entire Office Platform Org, and I had no idea what accessibility meant or what it was, and I went to an all-day seminar. It was led by persons with disabilities, and they had all the adaptive technologies. I had navigated a website, completely no vision. I used the little puffer to make choices and, and selections on my screen. And it really opened my eyes to what accessibility is. And we, we've also got lots and lots of data that accessibility, at any given time, they say something like 10 to 20% of the population is dealing with some sort of disability. Now, I know for myself, as the population ages, it's going to be more and more people are going to be needing the apps to be accessible. Sometimes it's a temporary thing. For example, my husband broke his arm, his right arm, so he had a really hard time using the mouse, and I taught him how to use the keyboard to navigate through things. He was like, wow. So that's a temporary situation. Another situation that they give in our examples is, say, a new mother is holding her infant in her hand, but she needs to work, but she only has one arm to do it with. So there's lots of types of what we call disabilities that aren't necessarily something someone's born with. It could be a temporary situation. So it really does impact your customers. Like you can definitely drive up customers if your apps are accessible, if your programs and your databases are accessible. I have links to some of these tools that Tom is going to demo. The primary tool that we use for testing Microsoft websites and Microsoft apps including web apps. There's Accessibility Insights for Windows. That's what we use to test access. And then there's Accessibility Insights for Web. And both of those are free. You can download them. Let me give you the link to Accessibility Insights. Here's Accessibility Insights for Web. Sadly, it's called AI. <laughs> So I always say Accessibility Insights now because people think I'm talking about something completely different. So Accessibility Insights for Windows is right here. And then there's a lot of documentation. I like this blog post I'm about to post. It gives you a really quick overview of what you need to do to test. One of the tools in Accessibility Insights is the Color Contrast Analyzer. That's part of Accessibility Insights, but it also is a standalone app which is much easier to use. So this is something like, say, Peter and I will get together and make sure all of his themes are have the right color contrast. We need to check that checkbox. <laughs> so here's the color. It's super easy to use. You just It has a little picker. And you pick the foreground color and the background color, and it'll tell you if it has the right contrast. The contrast is important for 
people who prefer the high contrast themes in Windows and Mac. Even on the phone, there's the dark. Windows 11 has a whole bunch of them, like aquatic and desert and a couple other ones. Night sky, that kind of thing. Color contrast analyzer. See Start me. with the Microsoft app, the Microsoft.com accessibility. Start with that link. It'll tell the story. It'll give you the tools. It'll point you to the documentation. Literally everything I just talked about is in that very first link I put in. And I haven't seen any direct questions in the chat. If you do have a specific question for Linda, feel free to either post it in chat or come off mute to ask the question. Sure. There's not very many of us here. Feel free to just top on and ask. If there are no questions at this time, maybe I will show accessibility insights a little bit in the context of Northwind. Sounds good, Tom. Mm -hmm. So here I have accessibility insights on the left. I already started it up and I chose the color contrast analyzer, which is the one Linda just mentioned. And on the right, I have Northwind 2.0 Developer Edition. And people who have already cracked it open might have seen that we have a forum that's not actually in the accessible through the UI, in the bar design, which is what we used to play with fonts and colors and contrast. And so that's what I'm going to be using here. So I'm going to take a look at this header section here. I'm going to sample the white color for the font and the blue color for the background. And as you can see here, the ratio is 4.7 to 1. And as we scroll down, we can see what that means. It means we passed for regular text. So text of a regular size needs to have 4.5. We are better than that. And we also passed if this is large text, where the ratios actually can be a little bit less because the font is larger, three to one. And for graphical objects, I guess doesn't apply here. We passed as well. So this is the tool that we've used a lot because I can tell you our first design had much more subdued colors. Also here, this button, for example, the contrast was a lot less. The white was not white. Um, it had maybe 15% black in it. And we were just below that level. And so when we submitted our first version to the Microsoft accessibility team, they're actually in India, they were very quick to write up a list of things that we had to fix, which we then went ahead and did. There were still a few things within Access that, unfortunately, Access being a tool that has a 30-year history, there was a situation, not in this form, I think it happened in Startup, if you had a group box that is inside of a subform, then the narrator, a second tool, that is trying to read the screen, cannot see that group box. If there's an apparent form, it's fine. But if it's in a subform, it's not. So we were able to mark that one off. They found it, but we then were able to convince them that this is not really an issue with Northwind per se. It's an issue with access across the board. And they said, oh, well, okay. They didn't make the access team go fix it. But... So on the backlog, I'm sure, and depending on other priorities, maybe they'll work on that. So that's it for accessibility insights. There are a couple of other tools. You can actually write test scripts, and you can inspect screen elements that are on the screen. I'm in a resolution now where it's a little bit harder to see what's going on. But people who know a little bit about how Windows works internally might recognize that a form has other elements in it and other elements in that. When you inspect them, see that little box there? That's the customer text box. That's the order date text box. It's found them. It knows what the text is. It knows that we cannot set focus there. 
etc. All kinds of properties are displayed here that are related to accessibility. So that's it for that. The second tool I want to briefly touch on. Tom, before you go to that, I wanted to point out that the Northwind team did not know we were going to have accessibility testing until we were ready to release. (laughs) And boy, did we learn a lot fast. I think that's the only way to describe it. So we had to go back because fixing the design form didn't fix all the code everywhere it was. So don't feel bad. You can retrofit your project. We did it. Yes, true. Second tool I'll just briefly touch on, and I hope you can hear. This is, this is the leading narrator, and it's called JAWS. JAWS Professional Dash Subscription. JAWS version 2023.2307.37. And so it looks at what's happening on the screen. On the form view, workspace. Order tip colon use chip plus F2. Detail section, customer collect static combo, best for you organics company to set the value, use the arrow keys or type the value. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. So what it just did is it read the screen and it read a few elements. For example, it did read this tip, use shift plus F2 for zoom window. It spoke the text. And it did recognize that the customer dropdown is active and it read the label and the current text and it said, use the arrow key or type to enter a value. So that's pretty good. At some point, though, I think it doesn't know as much. It doesn't know much about access itself. And so it happens that if I type in an illegal date and I'm getting a dialogue, it's going to read that dialogue to me. But you'll see that it's not just focused on the dialogue. It reads around the screen as well. See if you can hear this. Work with Traders Developer Edition 2.2 Tom Van Sip of Dialogue Order Tip Colon Use Chip Plus F2 for Zoom Window Customer and Did you hear that? It read the title. It did not yet read this text. It will eventually do that. But it did read the tip again. This is an example, I think, where I would expect it to just focus on this dialogue. This is the only thing that's relevant to the user at this point. And so why it's reading what is around it, I'm not really sure about This is what you would use if you were really focused on developing software for an audience that will be using screen reader. You'll have to use these tools and see how well they work and try to work with them as much as possible and improve your application so that the user gets the best value out of it. I actually want to report this back to JAWS and say, is this the best idea? But I'm a rookie at this. I just got JAWS a few weeks ago. It works much better if you have a page worth of browser window or a Word document. It's almost flawless. Applications with their unstructured data are, of course, a lot more challenging. Okay, that's it for my quick demo. So question, Tom. Sorry, I'm going to close this real quick. (laughs) We did hear that pretty good. That was good. There is different types of screen readers, right? And your user base could download whatever their preference is. Does Microsoft recommend a specific one that we should use during our testing? Is this JAWS one the best one or... JAWS is the most commonly used, but Narrator, which is built into Windows 11, I believe you just hit Control, Windows, Enter, Microsoft Narrator, or type Narrator into the search bar. It's a lot more pleasant to listen to. You can choose your voice. It can be male or female. She can be Australian. She can be from the South. 
our testers used JAWS and Narrator. Because Microsoft created Narrator, we tend to do the testing using that. So I don't want to recommend it just because it's a Microsoft product because the most popular one is JAWS. So I would recommend either one of those. I think you can download JAWS for free. Just let's see, I'm going to try to find the link here real quick. You, you may be able to get like a 30-day trial or so, but it is a commercial product. Yeah. Well, Narrator is built into Windows, so. How much does a JAWS license cost, Tom? I asked real nice, and I got a free license for one year. I don't remember the pricing. It's really meant for people who need this. And so then having to spend a few hundred dollars on the flagship product in this space is maybe worth doing. All right. Thank you. What's next? I did want to mention that one of the things I could share out, I made a note because I have to go dig it up somewhere, is Microsoft Accessibility Guidelines has all the Microsoft theme colors that if you use them with black or white, you will pass contrast. But those are like the Microsoft palette. And you might want to use different colors. But Microsoft recently updated its product palettes. And it's really vast. It's not just the traditional, if you remember the old Windows logo, yellow, green, kind of an orangey red, and that Windows blue, which we still use all the time. But there's a huge variation. So they've done a lot of testing on the color contrast, and I'll provide that chart because it's it's really helpful because you know that, hey, if I choose from this palette, and it has like the bold and the pastel and the tertiary and the primary, you know you're going to pass the color contrast. So that's really helpful. So I will follow up with that and find that chart and send it off to you all. Do you happen to have the Goldman Sachs document handy? I have it here on the screen. Okay, so this is what I would describe as a style guide that Goldman Sachs has provided online. It's open to the public. There are parts of it which you would try to interact with, and they'll say, you are not licensed to see this portion. But what it does for developers, I think, and I'm sort of thinking about doing a couple of presentations on this topic, If you organize and think ahead of time about how your systems will react across your corporation or at your client, whatever that happens to be, this will help you ask a lot of important questions. What are the principles about design, color contrast, text ratio? They've done a great job of documenting all of this, and it's available to you, and you can look at it. It doesn't cost you anything. No is what we don't want to do. The green check mark is yes. They talk about colors, icons, imagery, layouts. They offer their font to you for free. You can download the Goldman Sachs font. This is what they've determined. And what that means is all of their documents and all of their systems will be made to accommodate this design standard. And the sooner you come up with your standard, the less you will have to do like we did on Northwind is turn around and go back to fix everything. They give you some really great examples. They tell you about the colors. So it's more than just accessibility. It's about having that professional, polished look to the application that you deliver and to think about how you are going to interact like tab and shift and tab. So they're showing you a lot of things here. I'm not saying you have to do them all, but they're good questions to ask yourself when you're starting your project or when you look at your project to say, how can I make this better? Is to look at this and say, wow, I never really thought about that. I'm going to implement that, right? So images, they talk about how they want you to display them, where they appear, all of those things. This makes your app, more professional. Consistency, we know encoding is good. It's also good in your user interface so that they know what to expect from the application. This is something here, layout, that we were trying to do with Northwind as well. Having a consistent layout, thinking ahead a little bit about where things are going to be and using very, very consistent spacing. It's really hard to do. But you turn your your grid on and you align to grid. 
and you try to do everything in, in a very consistent way that really makes the application more quiet, easier to understand, things are in the same place. It's just an example of one company really spending time on this. And you can follow this, develop your own, but I would encourage you to at least give this some time. What's nice is that they're a global corporation and they shared this publicly for all of us to learn from. So I think that's commendable. Yeah. Oh, the writing guidelines, Tom, you want to go down to that real quick? Yeah, and at, at some point, could one of you post this link in? Sure. Chat? Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, the writing guidelines. None of these things are world shocking, but it's nice to have it all be together. And nothing is done haphazardly. It is done because there is a system that we're following. Like, OK is all caps, always. You don't have to do it that way, but if you make the K lowercase, then I want to see that everywhere. Just some examples. Do we use the word submit or do we use the word send? People have thought about it and say, in our company, this is what we'll do. Anything else on this one, Kim? I think we have it, right? No, I, I think we have it. But the other thing that's interesting is most of their buttons and whatever start with an action verb. What action are you taking because you click this button? Well, that's not specifically said that way. You can infer things and learn things by looking at it. Yeah, that's called a call to action or the abbreviation is CTA, like learn more, read more, try now, register now. So people know what they're doing when they click on it is taking them to complete that action. So, yep. I remember in the Northwind group, we had a discussion about are we going to use add order or new order or just the word new? After some discussion, the, the action verb, because new is ambiguous. Are we already on a new order? And this just tells you we, you are on a new order. Or is this to say, click here to get one more new order? It's also a great band from the 80s. <laughs> oh, <I agree. laughs> but it was interesting because some people were commenting about how long it took to get Northwind 2 out the door. Because we had those kind of conversations. Is the word supposed to be new order? How are we going to do this? So it was a decision action. by committee. <laughs> action verbs here as well. And on top of that, even to make it even clearer that this goes from one through four. And those numbers come back here with invoice date and ship date and, and so on. To reinforce the idea that this is a workflow. Where we put the information buttons we talked about, should it be in the upper right, in the upper left? Do they go anywhere else? So there was a lot of discussion around the UI and how it looked and how it would interact. I came across this style guide looking for something else. I don't know if they call it a style guide. That's what I would call it. Lots of good things to learn. To learn. Yep. So Linda, maybe some final words on this, and then we can go to the second half of the meeting. Well, yeah, like you said, Tom, when you first step into this accessibility world, you feel a little bit overwhelmed. I know I did. Having a style guide to follow is super great advice. Reading up on what the web accessibility guidelines are. There's a worldwide consortium that agrees with what makes an app accessible. Wow. It's called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, the WCAG, and then there's the WWW3. Those are the big global overseeing committees that we base the Microsoft guidelines on. Of course, you guys aren't required to follow Microsoft guidelines, but I highly recommend you become familiar 
with what some of these guidelines are, at least from the interface level, like what happens with these adaptive technologies. So just start there, I would recommend. Definitely, as people have talked about, start thinking about this sooner rather than later. (laughs) It's so much easier (laughs) to not have bugs in the first place. And you can always ask uh, the DL and tag me because I am the resident accessibility expert. So I'd be happy to answer questions. So Linda, do the people who build add-ins have to meet the Microsoft guidelines if they're building an add-in for Microsoft? Okay, very good. Very good. We will take it down from the app source or the Microsoft store if it is not accessible. So, yeah. Yeah, and there are different severities. There's SEV1, SEV2, and SEV3. There's a lot of accessibility bugs that are SEV3, like there's workarounds or, you know, it could be improved, but it's not a showstopper. So the SEV1s and the SEV2s are the most important ones. So definitely those. And all those guidelines I just mentioned are on the Microsoft.com slash accessibility site. So you can get to all that information. You can also get to Microsoft Style Guide and all that stuff too. But again, you guys can do whatever you want. I'm here to help you with your app, not to force you into the Microsoft box. (laughs) So the next thing I wanted to share with you is just like how to engage with me now, now that I'm the Access PM. This job is a quarter of my time, so I spend about 10 to 15 hours a week on it. The rest of the time I'm working on making sure all of the add-ins are accessible and that we're compliant that way. I'm also the front-end developer for a lot of our uh, developer, all of our developer portals, in fact, including the Access One, which has just had an overhaul. So if you haven't been to developer.microsoft.com slash access lately, check it out. And I'm also the content editor for the Office Platform team. Okay, that's four. (laughs) Some weeks I spend more time on some things. You know, the Access team, we're only six people. We have an engineering manager, Dale Rector. I'm the PM. Kelly Bowen, she's my manager, my boss. But she's also helping me in this new role since I've been a technical program manager and I've never been a product manager before. So I'm kind of learning this role. So she's helping me out. And then we have four fantastic engineers who I'm just blown away by how much they get done. It's amazing. And they're really fun to work with. And they all do read the distribution list. Now, if you want to go to one of the forums, you can go to the Access Tech Community. We have the Access Blog and the Access Discussion Group there. The Access Discussion Group, I know our our lead developer, Shane, is always on that. So that's a good way to engage with an engineer. Okay, so here's the Access blog. We follow up. There's comments at the bottom. You can Comments are open on the blog post. So that's another good place to engage with the Access team. And like I said, we're, we're a small group, and we share the workload of going out to all the community channels where we're listening. There's the Access Feedback Forum on our new feedback tool, and that's where you would go to put in a suggestion or a product request or feature request, I mean, and I look at that every week. So this is the Feedback Forum, and Access is the very first one, so because it starts with an A. So there's the Feedback Portal. There's also Microsoft Q&A has an access tag. I don't know if you guys are aware of that. That's kind of like Microsoft's version of Stack Overflow. You get not just the access product team, but access experts throughout wherever. So I've noticed that that is uh, getting a lot more eyes and people answering questions. So here's Microsoft Q&A for access. So just for clarity, Linda. Those last four links, we don't have to at you on. No, we no, just, just on, post just in there and email. you're watching those. Just on a distribution list that okay. I don't have Thank time to you. keep up on. 
later on today, I'm meeting with the scary people, which are the executives up above me, and we're getting approval on our roadmap for 2024 for new features. So very soon, I will be updating the fabulous access roadmap, which took me forever how to figure out how to do it. But now that I know how, I will be making sure that we're adding our features there so you don't think we ain't doing nothing because we got some good stuff planned. For example, we're going to replace the SQL editor, the SQL editor with the new version of that, which is way easier to use. I think the code name is Monaco. We're making access large address aware. That's almost shipped. We're also going to come up with new forms for IV charts or new IV charts, as well as continue developing our relationship with Microsoft Dataverse. So it's much easier for people to onboard to the cloud and not quite so mysterious and not have so many pain points. That's one of our features that we're going to be working on right away. And we're also working on the graph connector. So you can pull in data from different apps into Access, which I think will be really great for developers. I would want that. Uh, so there's a lot of good things planned for developers down the road. We're not going away. I know it's looked like in the last couple of years, we have been paying attention to the roadmap and spreading the message to our customers. There's a misconception that access is dying or going away, but it's not, I promise you. I think I Linda, got them all in there. Linda, when we last talked, you, Tom, and myself in getting ready for this meeting, you mentioned, which I'm not going to repeat uh, who, a large group that you were going to be doing to help them understand how to get to the cloud and all this and still use access. Will you be doing any more white papers? It seems like. Yeah, we're going to definitely improve not only the documentation, but the whole process. The developers right now are brainstorming a a Dataverse template. So basically make it like, hey, here's a click, (laughs) you know, click and off you go. Make it so it's more fail proof to move your data into the cloud. So definitely a lot more of that's coming up to ensure that we get those cloud customers and don't lose them to some other products. So we're definitely working on that. And since I'm a content person and a documentation person, guaranteed there'll be a better way to understand the process and not just a YouTube video that's two years old. We're going to work out the kinks. Linda, I've got a question if, if it's possible to interrupt. Sure. I'm Colin. I do the Access Europe meetings, which is the next one is Wednesday of next week. And by chance, it's the future of access led by one Soto MVP. It would be great if you could come along and say some of the same things that you've just said at part of that meeting. So it's exactly exactly the same time for you, but it's Wednesday of next week, the 4th of October. Absolutely. I was just about to add myself by the way adrian another mvp colin Talano, um i was just about to add that what linda said before if we had a meeting where she just kept repeating access is not about to die we are doing everything we can to keep access going and it's very viable everything's running nicely so you could loop that and everyone here would be absolutely happy for an hour <laughs> okay i'll think of something I've got I've got two kittens. I can make them talk. I can make a conversation and make a little meme, and we can email it to everybody. That would be wonderful. It was great that you did, Linda. I wasn't. That was no hint of criticism. I'm saying that that you said that is so positive for everybody here that you could even do it in a loop, and everyone would be yeah. happy. <laughs> well, I mean, come on. Somebody mentioned thirty years. We're not going to just throw it away. We've got tons of customers and a product that works, we just need to make sure that we can have people put their data in the cloud and make some other features, keep improving it, but it's going to, it still works. It's still a great product. We've been dealing dealing with access. It's going to die rumors almost from version two. Yeah. (laughs) May I ask a question? I I remember when access came out, I I worked at the Mm -hmm. company in, I think it was 92 or 93 and then I left and I started, of all things, an art gallery. And there was no art gallery management program. And I wrote my art gallery management program in Access. So I am a user. <laughs> I understand, you know, way back. And, and I also know that, you know, this is your livelihood. This is how you make money. You're, you're developing apps. These are your customers. 
it's important to us that we hear what you have to say and then we fix those problems that are most important to you. I, that's really the most important thing to me. So love to May hear I ask something? priorities and stuff. Yep, go ahead. Oh, yeah. my- um, Carl Donenbaum, who's with us at the meeting here, he highlighted last week that the new outlook is going off on one. And basically they are effectively saying they're going to drop the comma interface. And they talked a lot about com add-ins, but as access developers, our primary concern is that we use com automation to use access. To like send invoices and email. Yeah, we just, we're aware aware of this. I think there's something very important is that as access developers, we are actually more office developers i haven't got any application of significance that uses access that doesn't also use either word or excel or outlook or all three Mm -hmm. and that is actually what i tend to sell is what i sell is office solutions not access solutions and i don't know if you remember but in the good old days outlook came in as a separate entity whenever office was updated you had to wait a year for outlook to catch up or was it outlook overtook but you always used to go in, install office without outlook and then put either the newer or version of outlook in to go with it because it was disjointed from the rest of office i'm very concerned that that's going to happen again and as the access program manager have you got an influence beyond our own screams to scream at these outlook pods don't go running away from office yeah. automation yeah, I, I actually do. My office is right next door to Juan Belmoro, who's the PM for Outlook. We're making a lot of noise. In fact, this just was brought to our attention last week, and we are making a lot of noise about making sure that we don't make it so access developers can't talk to Outlook. That's just, it won't happen. Uh, I was a really concerned it wasn't in their initial solution might be the graph solution. There's a couple other solutions that they're talking about right now, and it is a priority. In fact, the meeting I have today, we had to reorganize everything to put this whole calm thing with Outlook at the very top of the list. So people are talking about it right now. And if I hear anything that I can share that's not under NDA, I'll definitely let you know. Thanks to Dataverse, we've just experienced two years of pain of mm-hmm. delay of the new web browser control. Mm-hmm. And we don't want it to happen with Outlook. It's all well and good giving us an interface which allows us to talk to it. But the most important thing is we need an interface where it will send events back to us. Right. We're hoping that Microsoft finishing the graph connector might solve some of the pain points with the Outlook issue, but there's a couple other ways. And I'm definitely not uh, technical enough to understand what they're working on. But I do know that I've been watching multiple threads and, you know, have a meeting about it later today. So it's a top of mind for us. Thank you. Linda, I have a question. This is Crystal. Do you use Access to keep track of any of your business or personal information? You know? I do. I still use Access. My husband and I collect art. I still use Access to manage our art inventory, including framing, suppliers, where our works are, if we have things out on loan. So, yeah, definitely. That's really interesting and wonderful that you love art. Yeah, I got a couple things behind me that are blurred out. Yeah, so still use Access for that stuff. We got tables for actual artworks, location, condition, medium, artist. Uh, we have an artist table. And then, like I said, a location, like because we have a, another place over in Seattle and then a storage locker. And then even, even here we lose, like, is it in the basement? <laughs> is it, where is it? So... We have a location table, too, so we can find the stuff. Well, that's wonderful. Maybe someday you can give us a little demo. Well, we're looking actually for a space. We'd like to do a pop-up gallery again. We did it in 2017. It was really fun. Yeah, so I still use the access for that. I don't want to buy a gallery management program when I can do it myself. Uh, I believe Richard has a question. First of all, a well pat on the back to the Microsoft Office team. I'm not an MVP, but I've been programming and access for quite a long time. But the pat on the back I want to give you guys is when Microsoft came up with 
an integrated solution. They did it right. I mean, you've got Access, you've got Word, you've got Excel, you've got Outlook, you've got, you got PowerPoint, you've got all those products, and you can use VBA. And uh, as we know, there's so much power to harness in Microsoft, in the whole Office suite, because we're passionate about Access. You guys did an outstanding job of keeping it alive. There's no way that Access is going to be dead because, like you just mentioned, there's a lot of customers who use it. And it's such a powerful platform. I mean, I'm still amazed on the stuff you can do. I'm learning from these MPPs. You know, I've been programming a long time, and I'm pretty good at what I do, but these guys are talented as well. But it's just amazing what you can do with Microsoft Access and the whole Office suite. Yeah, I agree. I'm also a big Excel fan. I think Excel is amazing. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else have any questions for me? I have a question, Linda. You said that about 25% of your time is for access. How do you envision using that time? I mean, what do you hope to do for access beyond accessibility? Well, right now we're talking about what's on our feature backlog and what priorities, you know, what we are to prioritize. So my next step, how I'm going to be spending my time is doing some user group research. So if any of you want to join any of those panels, please email me, lindalou at microsoft.com, and I'll be sure to include you in the research groups. That way we can find out what do we do first, SQL update or IV charts, that kind of thing. So we're prioritizing our backlog and then figuring out how long, how many engineering months each will take, each feature will take. We also spend a lot of time just basically keeping the lights on, hot fixes and QFEs and this, that, and the other, accessibility bugs, a lot of, we call it shield work. About 50% of our time is just keeping access running. We call it keeping the lights on just to maintain our monthly active users. It's definitely a challenge. I'm in the learning curve right now. I'm having a lot of fun. And it is really fun for me because, like, like I just told you guys, I'm an Access user. I'm an Access fan. I have a passion for the product. So it's almost like a perfect fit. But that's how we spend a lot of our time. I go to all the bug triage meetings with the engineers. I have a, a couple of weekly syncs with the engineering manager. But like I said, my next step is going to be doing more user group, user research, finding out exactly what customers need and want from Access, making sure that we prioritize that. That sounds so wonderful. I really look forward to Access being more in the forefront of at Microsoft, too. You seem like a really colorful person. And I think more people at Microsoft need to understand what Access is and what it isn't. Good point. Linda, this is Pat, and I'm a former MVP. A lot of the rumors about Access is dead originate from your SQL Server team, just so you know, right? <laughs> and for some reason, those people consider Access to be a competitor, and they don't understand what Access does, okay? Yeah. They look at Jet and Ace, okay, and compare Jet and Ace to SQL Server, and of course, they're found lacking because uh -huh. they're different tools for different purposes. But I wonder if you could initiate a joint venture or something with the SQL Server team and convince them of how useful Access, the rapid application development tool, could be for prototypes with SQL Server backends. Right now, they just turn their nose up at the tool and pan it. And they yeah. pan it to your big clients, which is yeah. why in big clients, there's this thing about where well, you can't go near Access because it's awful. There's no security and it just doesn't support any users and all the bad things you hear about access are really about jet and ace and the limitations the front end really doesn't have those once you disassociate it from from jet and ace yeah you mentioned performance we're working a lot on performance right uh, improving performance in that area in those areas and security, too. There's a lot of security fixes that are going on right now as well. Right. You, know, and, you know, as the developer, I would love to see a front end that works like the ACCDR. So basically, it locks out everything. I just want to be able to lock the door. 
Okay, the ACCDE doesn't do that. It still lets users in. Okay, you can still see tables and queries and macros and stuff like that. But for people who distribute access applications, it'd really be nice to just lock the door. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. One of the features is a, a new ACE. Don't know what exactly it entails. I just know it's on the list. Yeah. A new, distri- a new distributable. Oh, okay. That would be good. Yeah. I think one of the problems... A lot with- of, a lot, we're working on a lot of things with a small group. Some of these things might be, you know, 2024 20, by the time we get to them. Right. So that's why it's really important that we prioritize. Right. But, but, convincing the, yeah. that right. but convincing the SQL Server people that we're not the enemy would go just so far to the use of access in big companies. It's just amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think the other uh, problem James with access. asked about Python. We don't have mm-hmm. Python in access. However, you can export your data to Excel and use Python in Excel, but you know, we don't have any Python plans for 2024 yeah. or this fiscal year. Not to say it won't happen, but okay. could. I think one of the problems with access is reputation is that enterprise, large enterprise, found it hard to manage. And basically it got a bad reputation in bad high, large enterprise. Microsoft spent decades chasing large enterprise customers and slagged off access itself, saying use SQL Server instead and try to kill access off. The problem is access is a golden solution for small and medium businesses. It's an absolute yeah. essential ingredient for small businesses. And Microsoft itself has got a problem that it doesn't recognize small businesses. It doesn't do the math that, in fact, there are millions of small businesses rather than a few with millions of, of employees. And small businesses never get a look in. And that's largely the problem of access is its suitability for customers that Microsoft aren't interested in until they actually realize that when they lose all those small businesses, it all adds up to something. Yeah, I'm not sure I agree with you on that point, because from my perspective, the small users, the mom and pops, really, we know for a fact are the bulk of our monthly active users. We do have some bigger enterprise customers. I couldn't even name them, but I do think believe that the team is emphasizing small business and consumer. My point was that Microsoft don't seem to put as much weight into uh, into serving small businesses, the multitude of small businesses they have as customers, as they do the few big enterprises. Mm-hmm. They've got a large enterprise mentality. And some products. But, you know, when you look at the office suite, I mean, it was invented for every com- person every computer every desk on the planet not just fortune 500 companies but frequently when we go out and we look at the advertisement the marketing stuff for your various uh, office offerings access is not listed at all i know it's like they took that's us off. really bad <laughs> it's, I, I, it's just i tear my hair out. they literally took us off the office uh, right. page Right. So, and you have to dig really, really deep. Like I, I went to Brand Center. I'm like, can I get the new Access colors? <laughs> can I get the new Access logo? And it took, they're like, huh? You know, it's but, like. The great yeah. thing is when right, they did that, put it back, you they make, put it back to make free. more noise about it. <laughs> right. But that's what makes people think Access is dead. is exactly. because Microsoft treats us like we're dead. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Right. Sorry, you know, who cares I, I got about them? I'm buzzing around. I, I'm not blowing you off. I got to fly. This <laughs> yeah. Well, stuff, one of the things like that I just I'm you know we have to fix it. It's like either we are or we aren't. You know. It's, we one need. of the things that's interesting. So I was at a small firm. We got a whale customer, and if you make your whale unhappy, they make it very public, and it can be the end of you. So. I understand that the majority of what goes on with access and how big the small business is, if, you know, Elon Musk turned around tomorrow and said, Microsoft Office stinks, you can bet there's going to be an impact. I think everybody would start using Microsoft Office. (laughs) (laughs) Well, what I'm saying is when people with a big voice, I think it's a balancing act. I see it on both sides, why you have to keep them happy why you have to move their agenda forward. I'm just kind of saying there's two sides to it. Mm-hmm. But we're yeah, at time, I everybody, and I have another meeting I have to go to. 
Join us on October 31st to get free tools to list access objects from all databases in a path and document VBA code. Thank you so much, Linda. It has been such a pleasure for us to meet you. Mm -hmm. And thank you for taking time out of your obviously busy schedule to talk with us today. And we hope to be able to talk with you more frequently in either this group or some of the other many groups like Collins next week. And I think I can speak confidently for everyone here that we are just super excited to have you on the access team. Thank you. You're here. Absolutely. Also thanks to Tom and Kim for joining us today and all your insights into how you dealt with accessibility. I have a hard time with that word, too. I am. <laughs> okay, take care, everybody. Bye, Linda. Right. Thanks, Linda. See you later. Okay. This was a really, really great meeting, Maria, and surprising. It was not at all what I thought it would be, and just very interesting. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Well, it's great to have everybody. We had 39 people at the max, so that's a pretty big group. I'm excited. Too. I think Linda, the, the true draw, no offense, Tom and Kim. <laughs> no, so accessibility is important. Even if you're not working in Microsoft Access, you can, you know, use it for other. It's a I, great time slot because it spans Europe and States. We can yeah. never go to specific meetings because they're just too far out. Um, but your, your lunchtime meeting um, hits our time zone in a reasonable time, a reasonable period. Yep. Yeah, although I had one gentleman tell me he was going to be driving home, so that was going to be a problem for him. <laughs> Morning. <laughs> Don't but. worry, Maria, he never gets to my meetings either for the same reason. <laughs> I know who you mean. Yeah. I tried to get him to speak at one of my meetings, and he told me it'd be difficult while he was driving. I likewise have t trouble with the Pacific one because it's like <laughs> EP you time do. and Pacific time. And I'm like, I'm done for the day at that time. I'm not a late night person. You ought to try 3.30 in the morning, which is what it is in the UK. But Adrian's <laughs> still wide awake then, of course. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting then. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Right. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Bye. See you all next week. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. Bye, Colin. yeah, I will too, Colin. Bye. Bye. Yes. Bye.